My name is Mark Pedersen. Along with my partner, Regina Nelson, we're the founders of the UCS Therapy Centers, our national 501c3 focused on cannabis patient education, currently located in Peoria, Illinois, and soon Colorado Springs, Colorado, and CPN Institute, our benevolence arm, providing counseling and cannabis oil to the hurting and the needy. I was 56 years a Missourian before moving to Colorado. I grew up in a small, very polluted little town, Herculaneum, Missouri. That's actually what made me ill. You see, the principal industry there was lead smelting. The carcinogens were everywhere, outside and inside our homes. You couldn't get away from it, from the plumes billowing out of the massive smokestack to the dust that poured from the dump trucks that rolled up and down my street. Being leaded was a normal occurrence long before we realized what it was doing to us. As a certified welder and pipe fitter, I worked in power plants. Being exposed to environmental toxins like asbestos, calcium silicate, and fly ash was a daily occurrence. I also had a small computer consulting business. I had about 12 business clients. And a benevolence ministry, a food pantry, and related services. We helped people with food, their bills. I also did a lot of hospital visitation. I regularly worked 80 plus hours a week. While remodeling my home, I was exposed to heavy levels of lead, cadmium, and arsenic, the byproducts of the lead smelting industry. 85 years of contamination released from pulled up carpet and open walls. I became quite ill. Severe migraines, seizures, fibromyalgia pain, neuropathy in my hands and feet. I couldn't do the things I cared most about anymore. I could no longer provide for my family. My exposures stripped me of my profession, my ministry, my life, ultimately my family and my health. It was back in 1997 when I discovered a small blip on a fibromyalgia news group that stated that cannabis could be effective for treating fibromyalgia pain. I had already been the receptacle for virtually every drug the doctors could throw at me. I figured, what could it hurt? Nothing else was working. After a few months of using very poor quality cannabis from a friend, I discovered that it not only helped with the pain, and remarkably well too, it also took away the migraines that even experimental drugs could not touch. The seizures, the neuropathy in my hands and feet, the fibromyalgia, but perhaps the most profound for me was restoring my long-term memories, priceless memories, like the births of my three children. Why did I experience such profound benefit? As it turns out, all mammals are born with what is called an endocannabinoid system. This is, in simple terms, a lipid messaging system. When we consume plant-based or phytocannabinoids, they are similar enough to the endogenous components, the endocannabinoids, to perform as a supplement. They fit the endogenous receptors found throughout the body, much like a skeleton key. What we know of the endocannabinoid system is that it maintains and regulates all the primary systems of the body, homeostasis being the objective. Recent research suggests that it may well be our primary endocrine system. If this is the case, it's vital for all of us to have access to cannabis. When a cancerous tumor develops, very quickly endocannabinoid receptors appear about the tumor and engage the cells in apoptosis, or cell death. One of the attributes of the endocannabinoid system is the ability to isolate and terminate tumors. The health of this endogenous system really determines whether or not the tumor is allowed to remain. Regina's daughter Brianna came from Michigan to live with us. She was 26 years old and the mother of a three-year-old with special needs. Prior to the move, she was diagnosed with stomach cancer. Michigan surgeons urged the immediate removal of most of her stomach. Instead, she traveled to our home in Colorado Springs and began taking cannabis oil that I had prepared for her, along with drinking raw cannabis juice, a non-psychoactive superfood that allows phytocannabinoids to boost the immune system very rapidly. Within weeks of arriving at our home, she was rushed to the emergency room where they discovered that her tumor had broken free 
and was hanging by a small band of tissue. Needless to say, the emergency room doctors had no idea how to proceed. Brianna returned to our home and later passed the tumor. That's apoptosis. She is currently cancer-free. I began making cannabis oil primarily so that I could teach others how to do so. I knew of the miracles that surrounded cannabis oil. I followed a Missouri man, Brian Chitwood, over three years as he battled terminal melanoma. When we first met, he was recovering from Hodgkin's lymphoma. The chemotherapy he received for Hodgkin's caused the secondary cancer, the melanoma. I photographed cannabis oil applied topically, killing the tumors. I contemplated providing a slide for you all. If things like this bother you, you might want to turn away. Barnes Hospital in St. Louis took biopsies of the whole area. The black lesions are indeed melanoma, but the white lesions are curiously something else. They've mutated and are dying. Melanoma is not an easy thing to look at. Watching someone slowly die from it is like watching someone die of leprosy. Brian gave his life so that you could see the miracle that is cannabis oil. Others have given their lives as well, but because of their sacrifice, many more will live because the truth will be fully known. It was Brian who gave me my first ISO 2, one of the devices that I used to make cannabis oil. It was manufactured in 1978. He found it in a garage being used as an ashtray. Remarkably, it still works. Brian used his to keep himself alive for several years before conventional medicine finally killed him. He told me that he was passing it on to me after his death so that I could, in his words, make oil and save lives. So I did. Oh, I couldn't make oil in Missouri. ISO 2s are illegal in Missouri. A Missouri lawmaker saw fit to make it a crime punishable by imprisonment just for owning one. So I saved Missouri lives in Colorado. I have two ISO 2s now. In the past year, I have given away over $75,000 worth of oil to the poor and the needy, made with these two simple machines. Little Nova Lee was only two when I first heard of her plight. Her young parents did not have much living in Austin, Texas. They were ill-prepared to have a child with a condition like schizencephaly. Little Nova has only 24% of her brain and a non-functioning pituitary. Seizures began not long after her birth. Controlling her seizures quickly became impossible in conventional terms. Specialists came up with only two options, a drug that causes permanent blindness, their defense. Schizencephaly patients have questionable degrees of blindness due to narrowed optic nerves, so they considered blindness to be acceptable. Their other option involved removing two-thirds of her cleft brain without any promise that the procedure would impact her seizures and knowing full well that it may kill her. This young couple opted to place most of their earthly possessions in a dumpster, loading into the car mostly what was required to care for their disabled child and headed to Colorado. They had no idea how they were going to get medicine for Little Nova or even how they were going to live. I was in touch with them almost from the moment their journey began. Days later, Barbara, the mother, arrived at our home. Regina prepared a pediatric regimen of cannabis oil, roughly one gram FICO full extract cannabis oil per two ounces of high-grade olive oil. The mom took it back home with her and drew up a dose and placed it in Nova's feeding tube. Almost immediately, Nova Lee's seizure stopped. What emerged in the weeks and months to come is in all reality the rebirth of this child. Not only did Nova Lee's seizures continue to diminish, she is now 98% seizure free. In just a few days from her first dose, her eyes, which once wandered about independently, became fixed on her parents' faces. She reached out with both hands and grasped her father's beard. Nova began to mimic sounds from her mother and standing with her father's help. So many things that were thought impossible back when she was almost in constant seizure. Just a few months ago, Barbara heard her daughter say mama for the first time. 
most recently. Nova's doctors were amazed that now, not only is she thriving, but somehow she is producing growth hormone. Her non-functional pituitary is somehow working. These are the wondrous side effects of cannabis. The specialist in Austin told Nova Lee's parents that it was impossible for cannabis to help her seizures. They're still scratching their heads. But her new neurologist is quite curious because he's seen more and more of these cases. Miracles, really. Nova lives because of THC-rich cannabis oil. Gage is 10 years old. He's a refugee of Missouri. A month before his mom and dad packed up their family and moved to Colorado, Gage was on life support. He was dying. A grandma seizure, as it is for many, can be lethal. It nearly claimed his young life. Seizures completely altered not only Gage's life, but that of his whole family. He couldn't live a normal life, go to school, or play like other kids. Who would have thought that something as simple as a pediatric dose of cannabis oil could make such a difference? Today, less than a year later, Gage looks and acts like any 10-year-old boy. Only difference? he receives a small pediatric dose of cannabis oil, a dose that his school nurse calls incredible and therapeutically dosed due to his seizure control and increased performance in school. He's doing quite well. He looks forward to school and, unlike any kid I have ever known, enjoys his homework. It was a costly thing that Gage's mother and father had to do. Not every family with a special needs child is as fortunate uprooting themselves and settling in an unfamiliar and distant place, leaving behind their support system, their family and friends. Now a healthier young man, Gage's only regret is that his treatment binds him to the boundaries of Colorado and convicts him of being a criminal in Missouri, solely on the basis of his life-saving treatment. He misses his cousins and grandparents, but when asked at school what he wants to do when he grows up, he gave an interesting answer. He said, I want to make cannabis oil so other kids get well like me. Gage thrives on THC-rich cannabis oil. Over the last eight years, I have met and interviewed many people. Over 200 of my video interviews can be found on YouTube. City councilmen, mayors, governors, nurses, scientists, but mostly patients. So many illnesses are impacted by cannabis. After all, it supplements a system we already have in our bodies that touches virtually every facet of our being. What a perfect way to heal. Science has overwhelmingly proven that cannabis is non-toxic. In fact, science says cannabis is food. It has been food for the human race for well over 25,000 years. A superfood, more nutritious than flax. That's really what gives me the authority to make cannabis oil for the sick and dying. It's food. In fact, there are at least three children who would not be with us today if it were not for my oil. Cannabis oil. THC rich, full extract cannabis oil. Concentrated food. As Hippocrates said so very long ago, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. You know, I didn't get involved in making cannabis oil because I was looking to supply oil to the unfortunate and the terminally ill. That's a noble calling. I just didn't think of it. No, I started making cannabis oil because I wanted to know how, so I could teach others. I was fortunate to learn the simplest and safest ways first. As Regina later confirmed while presenting at a clinical conference in Italy last year, my method is also the way scientists around the world ensure that they are producing the best array of cannabinoids, terpenes, etc. It was during my learning curve that the patients began to come. And oh, how they came. The cancer patients, the seizure patients, the refugees, the terrified parents without options, and the children. Though there were many from within the borders of Colorado, Refugees poured in from literally all over the nation, and they're still coming. We have potluck dinners at our home. Many times we have filled our apartment with refugees from states like Texas, Illinois, 
Georgia, Nebraska, North Carolina, and most certainly Missouri. But I know that these are only the lucky ones, the ones who could afford to come. Many thousands remain in non-legal states, watching their loved ones struggle just to hold on to life, because they don't have the means to move or the way to purchase the costly but life-saving oil on the black market. What a terrible thing it is to know that your loved one will continue to suffer and eventually die, not because there is not a treatment, but because of geography. Hope should not be ruled by a zip code. But even in Colorado, as much as 90% of those who need cannabis don't have access. It's cost prohibitive. Colorado still has a thriving black market because of the strict regulations, taxes, and greed. Cannabis is less expensive and more readily available on the black market than in dispensaries. What's more, most dispensaries don't stock FICO, a full extract cannabis oil, like I make. It's not a hot seller on the recreational market. It doesn't taste good smoked. When you do find it, there is always the question of how it was made, what solvents remain, as well as other contaminants that could harm a fragile life. And of course, there is the expense. When the proponents of Amendment 64 were touting their recreational bill to the public, they failed to address their underlying intentions. We're seeing them now, hidden among the ever-growing mounds of regulation, all geared around promoting recreational use and funneling revenue through the dispensary model, while covertly restricting with hope of eventually eliminating home cultivation, caregivers, independent growers, and oil makers like me. Who cares if it costs the lives of the poor and the terminally ill? Cannabis reform is about economic growth. Tax dollars. If people want to smoke it, let's make money off of them. As one popular activist once said, we don't care. Tax the hell out of it. A few months ago, a good friend, a Parkinson's patient whom I have known and counseled for a number of years, passed away in Kansas City. He had been battling his illness for a number of years. He had tried every conventional and homeopathic treatment he could find. At one point, against my warnings, he spent $11,000 for questionable cannabis oil off the internet. He was desperate. I could have provided his oil at a fraction of that if he would have come to Colorado, but he chose not to. Remarkably, he did see significant improvement, but he didn't follow with a maintenance dose as I would have instructed him to do. It was too costly, and the risk of arrest was just too great for this 70 plus year old. I wrote the Missouri Cannabis Restoration and Protection Act over a year ago. I did so to fulfill a promise that I had made to the citizens of Missouri that I would write the bill that they really wanted. Not another compromise, but what the people really truly wanted. Real legalization. I knew what the people of Missouri wanted because I asked them in the many meetings that I held all over the state. The farmers told me that they desperately needed help. Industrial hemp could once again be a major cash crop for Missouri not in these wait-and-see research programs that have popped up in other states, but a real hemp industry, like we once had. But with 21st century technology, the big agricultural equipment companies like John Deere are waiting for us. They are already producing the tools for harvesting hemp in Europe and in Canada. Did you know that canvas paper, just paper, is a $200 billion a year industry in China? Just paper. With a wide array of products that can be made from hemp, particularly here in the Midwest, it's not hard to realize that in a legal and free market, cannabis represents a trillion dollar a year industry to the Midwest, putting so many to work and helping so many. As long as cannabis remains on the controlled substance list, it can never truly be legal. That's why the very first line of the Missouri Cannabis Restoration Protection Act removes cannabis entirely from Missouri's list of controlled substances. No non-toxic substance belongs on that list. Removing cannabis from the controlled substance list means it can be properly classified as a food. Over 25,000 years of being nutrition and medicine to the human race, it should be again. This is how we end prohibition and spark a new beginning, with truth. 
no longer hanging on to falsehoods, hypocrisy, and government propaganda. If we hope to undo this terrible social wrong, then we must in fact undo it, not continue to prohibit it in thinly veiled public policies. Every public policy that has been drafted or endorsed by any of the leading cannabis advocacy organizations has not only failed to reverse prohibition, but in fact endorsed it. Sin-based public policy. It's easier to tax the hell out of it if you think consuming it is somehow harmful, sinful. But consuming cannabis is not a sin, not if you examine the evidence, and not worthy of an excise tax, a sin tax, either. It is for that reason that my scholarly partner, Regina, endorses policy that is based on evidence, evidence like the real people I am discussing here, evidence-based public policy. Cannabis is food. Your liver sees it as such and passes it through to be stored in your fat cells. That's why a cannabis user can test positive days, even weeks after using, long after any euphoria has subsided. Alcohol and prescription drugs are held in the liver as it struggles to convert them into a non-toxic substance and expel them as quickly as possible. For that reason, heroin and cocaine addicts have little to fear of the drug test. To date, no scientific evidence can link blood or urine tests to impairment. Those who don't want you to read my bill say it lets anyone drive stoned. Actually, what it says is, the use and or possession of cannabis shall not be grounds for issuing a driving under the influence, DUI, charge, arrest, or fines when operating a motor vehicle. Basically, you have to be committing an actual crime. You can't be ticketed or arrested because you use cannabis or because you look like someone who does or because your car would fetch a good price if claimed by asset forfeiture. Profiling is bigotry, not police work. It's encouraging. I've received thank yous and well wishes from literally around the world since drafting this bill, but I've received criticism, statements saying that an eight-year-old could walk into a store and buy a bag of weed. That got me thinking. So I headed down to the local dollar store to take a look around. What I found was not unlike any department store, grocery store, or convenience mart I have ever been in anywhere in the nation. As you can see by my photo, this picture was taken at roughly an eight-year-old's height. There, at a child's height, were cold medicines, birth control, pain remedies, and at the end of the aisle, bleach. Around the corner, mice and rat poison. A child would not even have to leave the store to become contaminated, to be poisoned. After a careful review of virtually every food item, it was easy to surmise that cannabis would be the safest thing for an eight-year-old to carry out of the store. So really what this discussion has to do with isn't toxicity at all. It's about euphoria. But science has proven overwhelmingly that cannabis is not harmful. It does not cause brain damage, but actually instills neural protection, and that unlike pharmaceuticals and alcohol, it is actually good for the body and brain. My answer to that is actually found in the question, why, with so many toxins within reach, why are not more of our children poisoned? I know of very few cleanser and medicine cabinets across the country that have a padlock two simple phrases, parental guidance when you're a child, and personal accountability when you're grown. Or as the Bible states, and I paraphrase, train up your child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, particularly in regard to euphoria, if you have personal and or religious feelings against the experience of euphoria, and feel strongly against your child experiencing it, it's your job as a parent to instruct them so. It is not the job of law enforcement or the court system to enforce your personal beliefs. Laws have never stopped anyone from experiencing euphoria. Only the sound, educated guidance of a parent or guardian. A child knows to listen and obey his parents. More than likely, that is why you are here to hear this today. Little Isaiah wasn't quite three when his young refugee parents brought him to Colorado for treatment. They were Nebraska natives. They had exhausted every conventional means to control young Isaiah's seizures. For most of his short life, 
he had experienced an array of different kinds. When Isaiah was six months old, a family member with the herpes simplex virus kissed him on the mouth. Encephalitis quickly set in. His brain swelling, seizures soon gripped his tiny body. Genital herpes is a disease caused by the herpes simplex virus, of which there are two types. Type 1 usually causes oral herpes, an infection of the lips and mouth. Symptoms are commonly known as cold sores or fever blisters. What followed for little Isaiah was a procession of dangerous pharmaceutical drugs like Lamectol. Lamectol is a drug prescribed for bipolar disorder, but off-label for 2 to 16 year olds with irretractable seizures. Isaiah began an adult dose of this drug at 7 months. Though many drugs were tried, nothing seemed to hamper the ever-growing severity and number of seizures. Sudden drop seizures soon required that Isaiah wear a helmet. The parents knew they had to do something, anything, to stop their child's seizures. Cannabis was their last hope. Entering our home, it was all the young father could do to carry his flailing son into our living room and sit down. Isaiah was in seizure. After discussing the treatment, Rocio, Isaiah's mother, asked if she could administer a pediatric dose sublingually. With poor Isaiah flopping his head from side to side, it was difficult but mom pressed in with a needleless syringe and deposited the suspension between his teeth and lip. Three minutes passed as I observed Isaiah, his eyes rolling about, his arms and head flailing. A near constant experience at this point. But suddenly, he stopped. Isaiah seemed to wake up. Intently, he scanned the room. When his father spoke, Isaiah slowly and matter-of-factly rotated on his lap and gazed into his father's eyes. Surprised, his father stated, he's never acknowledged me like that before. It had been over two years since he had looked either of his parents in the eyes because of the constant seizures and the terrible drugs he was prescribed. This was life-changing. In the months that followed, Isaiah has continued to grow, exploring a life that is virtually seizure-free, and as importantly, free of the toxic pharmaceuticals that caused so much harm to his tiny body. He now follows his mom around the house, shouting, Mommy. He laughs and he plays. He's learning and growing. Isaiah takes a THC-rich cannabis oil, along with an oil that is rich in CBD to mitigate the withdrawal from the pharmaceutical drugs. For her first six months, Andrea's life was pretty much that of any healthy young infant. Then the unthinkable. As it was with Isaiah, a family member innocently kissed Andrea's lips, starting the same horrific chain of events. Only this was almost 25 years ago, and they live in Oklahoma. The only option Andrea's parents had was conventional treatment and a seemingly endless procession of pharmaceuticals and surgeries. Andrea had little defense against this crippling disease, rendering significant brain damage, both from the encephalitis and the toxic pharmaceuticals. Terrible seizures began with puberty and continue to this day. Andrea is now 25 years old. Scott and his wife take turns sleeping in Andrea's room so they can watch over her at night, a ritual that has not been interrupted for over 13 years. Andrea currently takes more than a dozen pharmaceuticals. Recently, doctors have recommended a VNS implant, which her parents are considering because they have few other choices there where they live. They know the AEDs are harming her. They're largely ineffective in causing aggressive behavior. She's been on them for many years, costing Scott's insurance company nearly $8,000 a month. A non-invasive treatment like cannabis is not possible for Andrea, though her parents are willing. Unfortunately, all the doctors offer is further surgeries and, of course, more drugs. Andrea has never had the opportunity to develop. Her cognitive skills are significantly underdeveloped. Unlike Isaiah, who is now flourishing and will someday catch up with his age group, Andrea has little hope, not in conventional terms. But what if things had been different? What if? In Kansas, there is a little girl by the name of Autumn, a beautiful little red-headed doll so full of life. At three months, 
Autumn started having seizures. After months of EEGs, MRIs, CAT scans, and a lumbar puncture, a genetics test told Autumn's parents that she had a genetic mutation called sodium channelopathy, or SCN1. SCN1 is the cause of her refractory epilepsy and is what made her prone to prolonged and febrile seizures. Autumn seizures are brought on by triggers, such as a rise in body temperature, being too upset or excited, or being fatigued. However, she has been known to have seizures without any trigger at all. She has never come out of a seizure on her own. They have always needed to be assisted with medication. This also makes her unable to use any of the anti-epileptic medications that affect sodium channels as they intensify the seizures. The few pharmaceuticals available to her have not been able to control her seizures. They do, however, give her side effects like irritability, loss of appetite, insomnia, damage to organs, and decaying teeth. They can also cause her to go into respiratory arrest. On the average, Autumn and her parents are in the ICU 34 times a month. On a regular basis, Autumn is put on life support. Autumn's neurologist has told her parents that she has exhausted all options. Her pediatrician wants her to have the opportunity to try cannabis oil. Unfortunately, cannabis is still illegal in Kansas. Her parents would risk losing Autumn to Child Protective Services if they were to give her even one pediatric dose. In fact, her state would sooner see her perish than have access to cannabis oil. Different paths lay out before Autumn's parents. Her mother, Christine, knows of Isaiah's story, but relocating is not an option, not yet. Truly, healing shouldn't know any boundaries. The rest of our nation's children suffer the same illnesses and afflictions as Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas children do. I know. I have made oil for children who were refugees from all these places, and many more. How can we deny these are most vulnerable, and knowing it's safe for even those whose lives hang by a thread, why do we jail our adults for appreciating its benefits? The blinders of prohibition have their root in ignorance. The only way to end either is with education. The truth. The truth is out there. I live with it daily. The miracles, they accompany us perpetually. As for America's chronically and terminally ill, they shouldn't have to leave their home, their state, to appreciate these things, to save the life of a loved one. All families should have the assurance of a safe, holistic choice apart from harmful, dangerous pharmaceuticals. It's time to put away the hypocrisy and accept the truth we know about cannabis. Cannabis is non-toxic. Cannabis is food. Cannabis is the single most important medicine of the 21st century and America deserves the healing it brings. Supporting real initiatives like the Missouri Cannabis Restoration Protection Act begins to undo the social wrongdoing that began in the 30s and continues to this day. It avoids the entanglement of prohibitionist profiteers, cartels, and the black market. Instead, it treats cannabis as a public health issue it truly is. The Missouri Cannabis Restoration and Protection Act is evidence-based public policy. The evidence, the living evidence, speaks for itself. We can't afford not to listen.